Okay, well, um, so I'm just going to do kind of a very basic introduction for the most part. Um, may do a little bit of interactive bits here. Um, uh, I think that uh, from the discussion, sounds like some people on the call, including Chris, um, may well know more about Compose than I do, which is great. Um, and I will uh, welcome people jumping in. Um, and I think an important part of this is also going to be uh, getting people to kind of volunteer and discuss uh, what they do and, and their best practices. Because uh, again, like I'm, I'm giving an intro, but I, I'll say, you know, we have a particular way of using Composer um, in our workflow, but that's not necessarily um, what you would want to do um, for your project or your company. Um, so let me just share the screen here. I'll just share everything. Um, so, and all right, I'm not even going to go into presentation mode. Um, so I want to flip around between the tabs here. Um, but just through this together quickly, so we have kind of a framework for discussion. Um, and just as a starting point, um, so it sounds like a lot of people had already been using Composer um, for work. I use Composer regularly. I would certainly not say every day, but um, you know, every week, um, uh, perhaps, um, and would certainly consider it a very important tool. Um, and um, just let me see. Okay, just try to hide these meeting controls so I don't have to look at them. Um, so Git Composer is kind of the website that you go to if you don't have Composer at all yet. Um, and so Composer itself is is an application and I think is written in PHP. And you know, of course, there's instructions here for downloading and installing it. Um, getting started and you know, the thing to uh, pay attention to is Composer is a dependency manager, which is a little bit different than a package manager. Um, so what Composer does basically is it allows you to specify uh, something you want, a PHP package at a certain version or a certain range of versions. Um, and you may do that with several of those, and each of those may it themselves specify things that they need installed in order to work. Um, and part of the magic of something like Composer is it figures out kind of the um, sum of all those versions, the intersection of all those versions of those those projects and their dependencies uh, that all could work together if possible. If if they can't work together, it's going to give you an error and fail. Um, but basically. Um, that's the magic. So if you know you are trying to install a certain version of Drupal, it has lots of other dependencies, and they have dependencies, um, and all of those things get installed without you having to name each specific one or figure out what the right version is. Um, the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that uh, something like Composer installs um, for a specific project, like a specific web application. Um, so you may be doing, you know, Composer installs um, for many, many uh, different web applications, um, and not, you know, it's not something that you uh, only have to do once globally. Um, so again, that's different if you're running your own server and you use some a tool like apt or yum, right? That's going to install the software package uh, for every everything that's running on that server. Uh, Composer does not do that. Um, so for um composer I'm not sure it will even tell you now but yeah i think someone already mentioned uh, version two of composer um basically is the version that no longer is quite as terrible in terms of its performance uh both in terms of time and memory um so it was a pleasant surprise when i could run composer and not have to give it like two gigabytes of memory for it to um run an update um so I would definitely make sure that you get uh, version two of Composer if you're starting on this um, and make sure you don't get version one. Um, uh, Composer itself does not include any notion really of tracking security updates. Um, it will 
tell you if there are updates, but not if there are security. Um, so there is a, an add-on if you're concerned about trying to integrate with um, what's known of the broader PHP ecosystem security updates. There is a, a tool you can pull in from the Trends of PHP repository, um, but that's kind of a voluntary effort um, and isn't uh, canonical. Um, in contrast, uh, you know, the Drupal project does uh, have a very canonical way to track updates and track security updates. So if you, you know, um, are using a Drupal module that has a security update, uh, you're much more likely uh, either through Drupal or through Composer to get an accurate um, warning that uh, something needs a security update. Uh, so with that said, I'm just going to like uh, give you an idea here of what kind of the real basics are, right? So um, Composer works, you know, a lot like NPM and, and some other package managers or vice versa, depending on your point of view. Um, so Composer install basically installs the code that's already in the lock file if you, if you have one. Um, you use Composer to require to add like a new module or some new code. It does have a command to check for outdated packages um, and has a command to basically update uh, as much as possible uh, your current packages based on version constraints. Um, and version constraints, I don't have a slide on this. Um, where is it? So, um, of course, I'm on, here we are. Versions con constraints. Um, this is probably one of the most important pages on the Composer documentation um, and trying to understand, um, in particular, uh, version ranges, um, right? So you can use specific ranges, uh, you can use wildcards, um, you can use this tilde, um, or you can use this caret operator. Um, and I think typically people, you know, it's recommends basically here, you can see recommended operator. Um, so basically if you do caret one, two, three, it's going to assume that version one dot two dot anything is okay. Version one dot anything up to two is okay. Um, um, and that, in contrast, um, you'll see here that this tilde operator can be a little more strict um, and could limit you just to this 1.2 range. Um, very well, very similarly, right? This caret, if you put the third digit, we'll also do that. Um, so it's these two, I'm, you know, work very similarly. Um, but you know, neither of them will allow you to do a major version upgrade, only minor or point version upgrades, depending on how you specify them. Um, you can, you know, also uh, apply more constraints on stability, or you can be more specific about the ranges um, and very specifically allow, for example, anything greater than one. Um, but you'll see most people use either this tilde or caret uh, version constraints. Um, in when they're specifying a version because that allows you to usefully run this command composer update. Um, so if you specified 1.2.3 with a caret and version 1.2.4 uh, comes out, um, then composer update will pull it in. Um, so that's, this is very like high level of the basics. Um, Again, Composer, typically if you're using this day-to-day, -day, I mean, you're gonna be, basically these might be the only commands you you, you need day-to-day. Um, -day. Um, so now let's kind of take a step back and talk about Drupal and Composer, right? So Composer is what lets the Drupal project uh, starting from Drupal 8, um, though there is also a backported way to support Composer in Drupal 7, it lets us uh, pull in Symfony, Twig, um, all these external PHP dependencies into the 
Drupal site that we're building. Um, if you go on Drupal.org and you go um, download the tarball, so for right, uh, so this you know is a way you can use Drupal without Composer still, right? Is if you download this um, essentially pre-built release um, behind the scenes, you know, there's a script that ran the Composer install and included all of that in in this tarball. Um, so uh, you can still install Drupal without Composer, but it means you're kind of handicapped at that point or, or handcuffed um, it, in that it's not really built in a way that's uh, convenient for using Composer to do more updates. Um, uh, in contrast, if you get Drupal directly from the Git repository, you're going to need to run Composer to install dependencies. Um, but there's a problem with that, which is that it, the Drupal from the sort of standard Git uh, Drupal puts the vendor directory inside the doc root. Um, and I don't know if that rings a bell to people, but basically the vendor directory is all the PHP code uh, from all those third party dependencies. Um, oftentimes, those uh, third party dependencies may include things like test code, they may include documentation, uh, they may include scripts that could potentially be executed over the web um, as CGI scripts. Um, so, there might be a lot of things in this vendor directory that you don't want actually accessible to the web server. Um, so, it's considered actually not a good great practice uh, to have this vendor directory inside the document root. Inside the document root means it's accessible through the web server. Um, so ideally, we want to do better than that if we're using Drupal plus Composer. And I'm guessing most people using it are doing that. Um, and the good news is that there is um, an entire uh, document page, documentation page that will basically walk you through how this works. Um, Right, and so the way you do this is you look for essentially a template uh, to install your Drupal site, a new Drupal project using this template. Um, so the template is basically this, which is not at all exciting. Um, it's a sort of a starting point composer JSON and composer lock file. Uh, you can see, you know, last updated in uh, November 2021. The um, composer JSON file um, you can see basically um, is just requiring a few things uh, of, of Drupal. Um, in particular, uh, the main thing that if you dig in as actually installing Drupal core is this Drupal core recommended uh, set of things. And that basically gives you exactly the same dependencies as in um, the um, Drupal tarball. So uh, in general, you don't want to install um, Drupal core by itself at this version using Composer. You actually want this recommended project. That way you get the dependencies, essentially the dependencies at the versions at which they were tested with Drupal core uh, for the official Drupal releases. Uh, there's also a pack uh, set of development dependencies. So if you want to run automated tests, uh, you uh, have that available here. And again, these this is a kind of pre-baked uh, to install all the stuff that you need um, for uh, running tests. So the the template project, as I said, is not very exciting, um, but gives us essentially a way to start a brand new Drupal site, Drupal web project. Um, using what are considered now sort of the best practices. Um, so that's, um, you know, so we've got instructions here. Basically, it's once you have Composer installed, it's really this simple. Um, you just kind of, um, let's see, we'll make, make this a little bigger. And now, of course, we can't see it. Um, so, um, 
So we can basically pick any name we want for a project. Um, and you'll see that composer create project, you know, this kind of thing you only run once um, is getting that code we just looked at, that Drupal recommended project um, is basically updating to the kind of the latest um, in the composer lock. So you'll see the composer lock might specify um, so, uh, assuming it specifies, well, maybe I'm wrong about what it does. Okay. But it's updated us to Drupal 9.3.2, um, even though the composer Jason just said basically anything greater than 9.1. Um, so congratulations, you've installed this. Um, so now you can go ahead, basically, and install Drupal. Um, and it gives you some you know, links here to documentation. Um, it also, it downloads these scaffolding files. Uh, so this is one of the interesting things about Drupal's sort of not slightly non-standard approach to uh, building a document route um, is when you install with Composer using this, it, it pulls in files, um, including index.php, um, from an additional repository. So you would think that that would be part of the Drupal core install, but in fact, it's not. Um, and, uh, you know, so all these top level PHP files um, uh, come from a separate repository kind of uh, of the scaffolding files. And these files, part of the reason why this works okay is that these files don't change very often. Um, so, um, you know, the other thing I, I'm not going to talk about, but uh, something I hope you, you have uh, in your tool chain uh, right, is Git. Um, and typically, uh, you know, depending on your deployment strategy, you might just want to go ahead and get add all that code that, you, that Composer just downloaded. Um, in other cases, you may only want to get add uh, the composer JSON and composer lock file and let uh, on deployment use composer install to install all the rest of the code. Um, so um, the nice thing about Git, um, you know, even though this is basically a throwaway demo thing, um, right, is I can show you now, um, right, so that, that just added a ton of stuff. Um, you know, if I wanted to use, now add something, um, so my next set of slides is just gonna be on, um, or next point uh, is gonna be on adding modules, but uh, one of the other things to notice is that if we look at what's here is we have, um, now a separation between the vendor directory and the document root. So if you mentioned, remember I said before that we had a problem with sort of the stock way Drupal does a composer install. If you get Drupal from Git, um, so if I you know look at uh, Drupal eight, which is not which is actually Drupal nine now, um, you'll see that the vendor directory. If I just do composer install um, uh, here in my Drupal 9 directory, um, I get the vendor directory inside the document root where I also have um, index.php. And please ignore all the crap files I have in here because this is a very old directory. Um, but in this case, this new project index.php is put inside the web directory um, and the vendor directory uh, is next to the web directory. Um, and so it, if you have your web server correctly set up, uh, it is impossible to access from outside the server or the vendor directory um, through the web server. Uh, so this is right, right away, given us sort of an improved uh, practice, uh, given us a better kind of security profile uh, for a Drupal install. Um, and, you know, 
also now we're kind of set up to, to manage things with Composer. Um, so if we wanted to, let's say, install uh, a Drupal module or a Drupal tool, we can now use Composer require. Um, and I'm just going to do Drush, even though I may not actually get around to doing a site install here. Right, but so Drush is the Drupal shell, uh, is a very uh, handy tool for just doing things like installing Drupal uh, from the command line or clearing your caches uh, or getting a database connection or one-time login link, all kinds of good things. Um, you see, um, you know, we've uh, made some changes uh, when I required Drush, right? So it's using version 10. Um, and since I uh, already committed stuff to compose to Git, I can see um, what happened. And you can see that by doing that, basically all that happened is I put Drush in here as a new line in my Composer JSON as something that's required. So I took this Composer JSON uh, and Composer lock file. I could actually put them in a completely separate directory, do Composer install and it would exactly match the things that I have in the current directory. Um, so that's part of the advantage of using a tool like Composer. It lets you exactly lock to specific versions and consistently reinstall those same versions uh, of every dependency. Um, and you'll see that uh, the bigger impact that installing Drush has was on my Composer lock file. Um, so this content hash kind of tracks what's in Composer JSON, which we just saw changed. Um, and now you can see, I mean, there's like a lot of stuff added. So Drush has a lot of dependencies, right? And I didn't have to think about all these. I didn't have to install them one by one. Um, all of those came uh, because I did that Composer require. Um, uh, another Composer command I mentioned was Composer outdated. Um, and you'll see, uh, this may or may not be surprising, but you know, Drupal 9.3.2 does not necessarily have the most up-to-date version of all the dependencies. Um, you know, so some of these things are like this Composer Semver, uh, that's probably a safe update. It's like a patch version change. And quite likely the next version of Drupal core um, will recommend moving to that, that patch version. Um, then you'll see something, um, you know, I don't know, this uh, dependency injection container, I don't know what dependency uses that, but you'll see that we have version 341 that may be used by Drush, um, and the, the latest is much later. Um, similarly for Symfony, right? So Drupal, a number of Drupal components are built on top of Symfony, including the request and response stack. Um, and you'll see that Symfony, uh, Drupal is depend working on top of Symfony version four, but Symfony version five is available now. Um, and obviously that's something that uh, will eventually be incorporated in a future version of Drupal. Um, oh, and even worse, uh, this web Mozart thing is uh, abandoned and probably we shouldn't use it anymore. Uh, I believe that's just one of the development dependencies. Um, but again, um, something to be aware of when you see this message, you know, or this one, doctrine reflection being abandoned, uh, you know, you should consider switching to whatever other suggested dependency is available. Okay, so let me, I just threw a lot of information out there. Um, let me pause and see if uh, people have kind of questions about this. Uh, basics of uh, using Composer and creating a Drupal project from this recommended project um, or comments on, on anything I got wrong so far. And just unmute yourself and jump in if you want to either ask a question or, or make a comment. Question. Um, <clears throat> on the uh, recommended uh, replacement or removal, um, where it was outdated, um, mm -hmm. how does one... Can you address what, how you uh, um, modify your pack um, um, script? 
Yeah, so um, I think it depends a little bit where that is coming from. So like this doctrine reflection, um, right, is not directly in composer JSON, it's in composer lock, um, right? And so I'd have to look at, uh, Wait, is the question why it's installed? Yeah, so why is it installed? In fact, composer, uh, yeah, y, so, composer y minus r in the name of the library. Um, <clears throat> the question is, how, how does one, uh, the proper way to get rid of it? Get rid of it? Oh, get, wait, get rid of the fact that it's old? Yes, because it's uh, right, this, outdated. Well, in this case, because another library is locking the version of it, uh, which right, is so, you know, sort of, it's a relatively rare thing that Drupal does with this recommended thing. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, in fact, it Drupal core itself uses doctrine reflection. Um, so more or less at this point, you don't have an option. Um, there's probably an issue somewhere on Drupal.org to figure out how to replace um, the, this dependency if it's really abandoned with the new with the new package. Um, so there's really two cases, Steve. So one case is if you're you know, again, our um, if you look at Composer JSON, right? The list of things that are actually directly required in this project is very small. So if it's if it's something you directly required, like the equivalent to my requiring Drush Drush, um, then you basically just can um, you know remove the previous dependency from your Composer JSON and Composer require the alternate dependency, um, that may mean you have to tweak your code, right? So somewhere in your code, like that new dependency may have a different namespace, may have a different API. You know, there may be something else going on, right? So it's 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 not just as simple as replacing it here. Um, you may you have to account for the fact that it's different code, and that's probably why Drupal Core hasn't switched, because you know it means someone has to go through and figure out. Um, how to rewrite uh, some usages in Drupal uh, to use that new um, annotation um, yeah. code. And strictly, Drupal's been at test it end to end on those specific versions. If you pass a minus capital D to outdated, it will show you like what ones are actually in your composer file that are outdated. Okay, so composer outdated minus D. D. No, after the outdated. Oh, after the outdated. And it's capital D. Capital D, of course. <laughs> um, that'll probably say not. Yeah. So, composer installers is actually in the composer file and is actually updated. Right. But it's a so, major version of it. So yeah, I don't. I mean, that may just uh, be that the people maintaining this this framework, you know, haven't had time to figure out how to iterate with this new version of composer installers. Um, I haven't looked into this. Um, Composer does have plenty of help on the command line. So if I ask for help on outdated, right, I would um, see all those options, um, including that capital D um, direct. Um, so, um, and lots of other options here. Um, so I think, so does that answer your question, Steve? So it's like, you know, maybe I could go and update to this new version composer installers and maybe that would work. Um, uh, for other packages, probably I'd have to rewrite my integration code uh, to some degree to, to switch to a different package. It's not trivial is the point. <laughs> it's not trivial is the point, right? Which is why, you know, which is why you're still seeing those things in there and they may be still required by Drupal core, even though they're technically abandoned. Um, Abandoned. This, yeah. This is Sorry. like even even among other projects I've worked with on languages and everything, it, this is a rather uncommon thing that Drupal has like this really specific set of versions that you can use. I mean, I'm not saying it's good or bad, it just is. Um, it's probably good. That, you know, so, so yeah, but when you look at your list of dependencies, some will be out of date and you, just, you don't, you're not supposed to upgrade them. You just, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to upgrade them. Um, if they're in that kind of list of Drupal core recommended 
items, right? And, and basically the way that Drupal core recommended things, it, it will lock those to a specific version. So if something else you're bringing in uh, a Drupal module, let's say, has the same dependency, but has a looser version requirement, you'll still get the very specific one recommended by Drupal core. Um, and recommended basically just means it's actually been tested um, in kind of the automated testing framework before the Drupal release. Um, and hopefully get, that gives you more confidence that um, that when you do that update to, you know, that new minor version of Drupal, um, you're pulling in, you know, exactly the set of dependencies that are guaranteed to work. Also, uh, Drupal recommended, is that going to be auto updated also in through, through the compro composer? Yeah, so, um, so it, um, you'll see here that basically, I mean, so, I mean, so we're, right, so we're actually looking at core recommended, um, which is, you know, has those specific things. And we're saying this carrot here says basically allow us to update to later versions of uh, Drupal, uh, Drupal 9. Um, so um, basically as there are Drupal core releases, this thing will get a new version corresponding to the new version of Drupal core and it will uh, pull in all the exact dependencies of that version of Drupal core. So basically if you, stay up to date with whatever this is, you will have, up, you will update all the dependencies from Drupal core. Sounds good, thanks. Yep. As far as I know, Drupal is the most interesting and complex usage of this package manager in the PHP language that is, you know, open source software. Yeah, and, and I think part of, yeah, it, part of that complexity is right that Drupal for a long time existed without Composer. And so the process of making Drupal play nicely enough with Composer has, has been a long and winding road. Um, and that's partly why, you know, as I mentioned before, if you install Drupal from the Git repository, it doesn't actually kind of do the best thing um, as far as organizing the Composer vendor directory. Um, that's partly because the, the way the Git, the code is laid out in the Git directory is just sort of a legacy, you know, that goes back all the way to essentially Drupal one, right? And is, you know, hasn't hasn't been reorganized since then. Um, okay, so um, question, if I could, uh, yeah, just on, on the install, uh, <clears throat> yeah. it used to be, and I don't know if it's still true. Uh, you can either globally install um, Composer or you can install it locally per site. Yeah, is there any opinion, recommendation, uh, rationale for choosing one over the other? Or, or like, when would you, how do you choose? Um, yeah, it depends a little bit. Um, so, I mean, for this kind of stuff, I would just use the global install for, I mean, but for the individual projects we're doing, we use Docker. So, you know, we basically, the Docker container has a very specific version of PHP that we're going to use to deploy the code. Um, so we want to run Composer inside Docker. So it's, it's not exactly the same as a global versus local install, but it's, um, it's a still sort of a project specific Composer install, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess my I guess I'm thinking in my own case where I have a virtual private server uh, yeah. out out there and uh, uh, originally was installed globally, uh, but I have to update it to uh, two point oh. And uh, I was wondering, is there any advantage to installing per site? Um, I'm not aware of any specifically, um, but I mean, I think it would really be if you had some problem where. A, let's say a site needed composer one for some reason um yeah that makes sense i get it uh maybe if anyone else has has an idea you could jump in um the other nice thing about composer um or nice ish at least is that it has a self-update um operation so if i run this i just got yeah, version 2.2 from version 2.1 um so 
running Composer self-update is probably something you just want to do on a regular basis also. Um, uh, it doesn't Will have update, like auto-update. Uh, uh, to from one to two? Um, it can. I think you, if you're on the later versions of one, I think if you do like a dash dash two, it will update you to the version two. Um, it's probably... There's the uh, new thing. That's, that's the, the new that's thing. The, that's the plug and allow thing. Um, so, okay. so plugins are like, um, can kind of do anything on your system. <laughs> so they're like extraordinarily, you know, um, you have to really, really trust them. So it's asking you, are you okay with these plugins? And it will actually write them into a stanza in the composer JSON file that you'll allow those specific plugins to run. That's so that some kind of transit dependency can't add a plugin one day um, that you didn't see coming. Yeah, that's interesting. So that must have been this yeah, version 2.2. Just, had just that. released. Last yeah, week, version yeah. 2.1 did not have it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as Chris is saying, like Composer plugins. Uh, so basically, if you allow Composer plugins, it basically means that a third party dependency could basically have scripts that execute and do whatever they want on your server if you run Composer install or Composer update on your server. Um, uh, and just what I was trying to find for Steve here is if this dash dash two is force an update to stable channel using 2x version. I think I think this dash dash two flag is supported in the latest version one uh, composer also. Um, so you have to be up to date on version one and then you could use it to switch itself to version two, I believe. And Thank it looks you. like I could switch back to version one if I wanted to. So okay. totally, di totally different than answer questions. I, I have a comment. Sure. So we also use um, Composer as a build tool. So it has it has scripting capability um, where and which includes lifecycle scripts. But essentially, you can you can tell it to run other things, including language code or shell scripts or whatever, when something else happens. So you can say like on Composer install, I would like to have this happen after it or something. Um, so we use it to actually conduct our builds and things. So you can do more with it than might be immediately obvious. So you can get by so, without adding it. So you can get by without using make or some other build tool. Hmm. So I don't know how to get back. So probably I actually want, want these enabled, right? Yes, you do. <laughs> so how, how do I enable those, Chris? Uh, you say yes, uh, do Composer install again and just say yes and to them and then it will, uh, it will write them into a Composer file. Um. No. What was the command that caused the list? Did you say yes? I didn't say yes. You just control C. I don't know. Some, something I you did, didn't mean. I did no. Um, I did. Oh. I was doing composer help, and it asked, started asking me about those. If you say no, I think it saves that fact or something. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. If there's a plugin section inside the code, you can yeah. and see the magic of get. Uh, here we go. You're right. So now it disabled allow plugins. Um, yeah. So probably if I, um, right, so I could <clears throat> wipe out all my changes <laughs> and go back to. Let's say requiring a uh, required rush again. Yes, now it's going to. So just to be clear, I just like undid this change. And now this allow plugins doesn't know. And right, composer installers um, is the thing I'm using to install, uh, especially Drupal modules, probably in a specific location where they need to be. So I do probably need that. Uh, Drupal core composer scaffold is the thing that gives me the index.php file, so I do need that. And Drupal core project message, um, I think is one, it's probably going to pop up messages if I'm using like a module with a security event, uh, outdated no. version. No, it, it's messages no. inside composer like donate to the project and stuff. 
Oh. Okay. So I may or may not want that. <laughs> well, let's say yes, because it's, it's a Drupal. It's why it's coming from the Drupal project, so we believe that it's trusted. Um, right. So now uh, you'll see if I get diff, all these are set to true in the allow plugin sections. Um, and yeah, uh, so Chris was saying that this is kind of a brand new feature in Composer. Um, so you may not have seen that yet, and you may get this um, message uh, out next time you update Composer and do a Composer install. Uh, so kind of be be prepared. It, it doesn't interfere with uh, continuous integration right now because um, in well, in, in most cases, you're running at no interaction uh, in in CI, and if you are, then it will just keep it will keep running and not bother to ask a question and let them work. That is until the version that comes out in June, I think, or something. In which case, if you haven't allowed the plugins, it will no longer run. Hmm. So, okay. Um, so, and um, yeah, a lot of what we were just talking about there kind of is um, keeping Drupal up to date, um, right? Or really keeping all your code up to date, but you know. This, this talk is focused a little bit on Drupal, but the same thing would be true if you're running just a Symfony web app or anything else. Um, so, um, you know, the in theory, this is really easy, right? So it's basically just a cycle of running Composer update or potentially running Composer outdated, verifying, you know, taking a look at what's there, running Composer update. Um, Composer outdated, right, may tell you that you need to move to a new branch, um, or you may need to pull in an alternate project. You need to budget time for API changes. Um, you may also try a tool like um, Dependabot. Uh, um, so um, instead of, so one way to do this is, right, you need to, need to kind of plan in your development cycle uh doing this you know manually um and about you know paying attention to what's available and uh testing the result and committing uh an alternative right is using a tool dependent bot is just a version i know about i'm not using it uh myself but it integrates with composer and lots of other things um and basically it will on github automatically uh apply version updates uh in composer and create a pull request against your project asking you whether you want to go ahead and update that dependency. Um, and I believe there are other tools that will do basically exactly the same kind of thing, but not necessarily tied to GitHub. Um, so those are two kind of strategies uh, you could use, uh, basically a process with your team or yourself, uh, put on the calendar reminder um, every so often, go and run Composer update and Composer outdated um, and kind of just See, see what needs to happen and uh, validate, or you could use a tool like Dependabot. Um, this becomes much more helpful if you have automated tests, of course, of some type of your site so that you know um, that that version update um, didn't break the site or at least didn't break it completely. Um, you know, at least it still installs still service pages. Um, so you might, might or might not then feel comfortable to automatically merge that, you know, to go ahead and merge that um, and think about deploying it or, or doing some further testing. Um, so you do need, you know, potentially to budget time for this. This is not free. Um, uh, there's also uh, a Drupal Composer, Drupal Security Advisories package, which I think will help alert you if you're installing something um, in using Composer that has a Drupal security um, advisory against it. Um, so, you know, again, this will help you if you're doing your work on the command line, uh, Composer outdated might tell you just that there's a newer version of a Drupal module, but not tell you that it actually has security advisory and you need to update more urgently. Um, so that's where this, this comes and helps. Um, and, Where am I? Um, so, and I think, you know, we've also mentioned already that there are other um, tools uh, for other languages that are very similar to Composer. 
Um, so NPM, we also use for uh, when we need to build and install things, JavaScript packages in order to build uh, front end components. Um, NPM, for whatever reason, NPM install actually potentially doesn't update also, but there's this command NPM CI, uh, which installs exactly what's in the lock file. And basically, the, otherwise, you know, it's relatively similar. NPM outdated will help you look for what's outdated. NPM update will help you update uh, to the latest version of the packages uh, based on what's allowed in your, your top level uh, package.json file, uh, which is equivalent more or less to the composer.json file. Um, so that's kind of the big picture I have. Um, at this point, I kind of wanted to uh, step back and open it up for discussion. Um, so I want to discuss your process or have, you know, open it up for people to jump in and talk about really how they're using Composer um, to uh, install and maintain Drupal, um, how, what people's process is for keeping their sites and code updated, um, and how they deploy. Uh, those built code bases uh, with Drupal when they start from Composer. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing, and that way uh, maybe other people can jump in and share, or at least we can look at each other while we're discussing. So I hope that was helpful. I'll throw a PDF of those uh, up somewhere um, and link from the meetup um, after this as well. Thanks, Peter. I'll go first since it doesn't seem like we have any other takers. So um, I, uh, I primarily use Pantheon for Drupal site hosting. And so the Pantheon has, you know, the, you push everything or you commit everything uh, that you built locally with Composer or their more modern way, which is the better way is that they build it for you. Um, and so I definitely like that approach more, uh, just having to only commit the Composer JSON Composer lock files. Uh, in the process of moving sites over to that, um, they have some documentation about uh, switching those from the, you know, you build it locally or you put it through CI and deploy Pantheon um, and to the, uh, the newer way where you just deploy Pantheon and they build it for you. And, you know, that has its um, ups and its downs. Like if the build fails for some reason, you know, you get a notification, you got to kind of dig through it. But uh, generally, it's been pretty easy, and uh, less stuff in my Git repository, so that's not a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that yeah, that I mean, in some ways, it's preferred, right? So your code base doesn't have to include um, anything except Composer and basically your custom code. I guess that's something I didn't touch on, right? So if um, if I had you know, custom module code, clearly I have to commit that to get even in this example of like the um, using Composer to install Drupal core and all the dependencies because obviously my custom code can't come from Composer. Um, so sort of minimal code base is like that Composer JSON, Composer lock, and then the modules directory containing your custom modules. Um, um, so that's a uh, um, I mean, and for for me, I said, you know, so we have a process of updating, you know, roughly every two sprints or so doing Composer update, unless there's something urgent like security release. So we, you know, we budget time at the beginning of the sprint and assign someone to go and run Composer update and kind of verify, you know, what all the things are and both the, you know, automated testing and do manual testing if needed. Um, so that I feel like is often enough that we were not, you know, left for a long time on updated versions of things. Um, but it definitely, it, it adds overhead, um, mm -hmm. the more often you do it. So it's a balance between often enough and not too often to be wasting your time. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, we're using Docker. So we actually go ahead basically and build, do the composer install and, you know, build those as a Docker image. So we're deploying the built code base in a sense, but what we have in Git is only the minimal thing, the custom modules and Composer Lock and Composer JSON. So, so if I check out my, you know, 
you know, Drupal project I'm working on for work, I have to do a composer install. Otherwise, you know, there's no way to run it. It doesn't have Drupal core. Yep. So other people want to jump in on, on what, if anything, they're doing uh, related to, um, I thought I heard at least one other person saying they were using composer to, to build and deploy. I'll just mention that you can, um, you can also um, put any patches um, in your in your in your JSON file, your composer JSON file. So that's that's neat. You know, if you find that you're using a patched version of of a module or something, you can add it in. Um, there's just basically a, a section for that. So that's really cool. Yeah, that is that itself. I think you have to pull in as the code that handles that is itself a dependency you have to pull in. Um, uh, which is called the uh, CW Egan's composer patches. Uh, yes, that yes, that's that's right. That it, yeah, I I forgot about that. Thanks, uh, Chris. And um, but it, I'd but like to neat. um. Oh yeah, Chris. I'd like to yeah. say to be very very careful when you're using that. Never to point at a merge request diff. Oh, you were yeah. breaking up there. Can you repeat that? I was chewing. Sorry, I was even ruder than that. <laughs> um, if you're using a patching solution like that, do not reference merge request diffs. Hmm. Okay. So if you if you go to GitHub or something or anywhere else and you put a dot diff on the end of a merge, you know, like a merge request or pull request URL, you'll get a diff file. And it's, it's very unsafe. Uh, because that can be changed by you know without your knowledge or understanding about what's going on with it so in most cases uh if you can't get um uh, like a patch on an uh, like an actual file on an ftp server or an http server something that you can actually get to is fine um that won't change is okay or you should download the diff at that moment in time um into the code base and install the patch from that mm -hmm. So I've seen where people like create a now in Drupal though where we're using GitLab, right? And there's a way of doing a dot patch at the end of the thing. So you're saying that that too is insecure? Unless you are the maintainer of that fork, right? I would never do that. Especially now in Drupal.org because multiple people you don't know can mm -hmm. suddenly just start pushing anything to that branch. Okay. Yeah, I mean, with people actually uploaded a patch file to Drupal.org is safer, right? Because it's a static file. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can construct the URL in such a way it specifies specific hashes, but yeah, mm. uh, get hashes, but yeah, it. Um, this uh, yeah, tool really. does, does have the option either to grab something out of a local directory or uh, through HTTP. So yeah, you might, if you, there's a specific, version of the pull request patch essentially that works for you yeah you should probably save it um, in a patches directory and use that um, in your composer json um, so good point chris so yeah this and and that's not included in that drupal template project and probably itself would require you to opt into that plugins um, thing um, let's try. Yep. So that composer complains that it requires a composer plugin and I need to allow it. So, um, but yeah, uh, so that's very handy because again, not, um, Sometimes you need to change things, you know, for your own custom uses, and sometimes, um, you know, it's just a bug that's not actually, and the fix is not accepted yet um, by the maintainer, wherever, whoever they are. Um, so, does anyone else want to comment on how they're keeping up to date, or maybe Chris, do you have a process uh, for keeping up to date um, in terms of composer updates? Um. We we use uh, Renovate Bot because um, we, we're using GitLab. And you can't use I mean, Dependabot. 
used to be a separate project from GitHub and so GitHub completely, you know, ate it. Right. Um, so Dependabot is like an open source version of that. It, it, it maybe the only, I mean, the upside um, to it is that it, it's actually not security focused. It's any independency and you actually can't really constrain it to only security uh, updates. So it updates everything. Uh, but it will update and merge uh, pull requests based on whatever rules you set up. And it's incredibly highly configurable, uh, maybe to a fault. We actually run it in a Docker container um, and with, with like a, you know, with like a, um, an OAuth token for someone's Git, uh, GitLab account. Um, it has merged like, I think like something like 7,000 merge requests uh, for us in a year. Um, and if you can, Tell things like, oh, if tests fail, you know, assign it to this person or that person. Um, it works with most package managers simultaneously. So it'll open up all kinds of merge requests for different projects uh, for whatever it finds. Um, pretty happy with it, actually. So you're using kind of the open source version of dependent bot and not the one integrated in, in GitHub? Yeah, yeah. Or it's Renovate. not dependent bot, it's, it's called Renovate Bot. Oh, Renovate Bot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty cool. If anyone's on Slack, if you just, if you search renovate bot, uh, there was a chat I had in some channel with people that were asking this question that I talked about things that I posted some configs for and stuff. So it itself is a GitHub package, huh? Yeah, it's actually written in JavaScript. Hmm. So if we don't have any more composer feedback discussion points, maybe we should move on to Steve's question and also see if anybody else has anything they want to talk about. Sure. So Steven, your question was about how do you integrate uh, Amazon, Google ads into Drupal or whatever application, you know, web tech you're using, right? Yes. Does anyone have experience with that? I haven't touched Google ads in forever. <laughs> there used to be a, uh... <clears throat> Some kind of uh, plugin module that uh, handled that at one time, but I think it went away. And I just really haven't, I've been away from it a while. So I was just looking to see if anybody had any current, current experience uh, on integrating any of those. Are you the only editor? Yes. That opens up, that opens up more possibilities. <laughs> like, um, you know, like you could just give yourself full HTML format and paste in the widgets they give you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a way. <laughs> if it's not, yeah. you know, that big a deal, that'll work. You know? Yeah, I just uh, looking for any recommendation of any sort. I mean, if that's the only option, then uh, that'd be, a, you know, I guess, um, like I said, at one time there was a, a plugin for Google, but then uh, I don't think that exists anymore. Yeah, there's this Google AdSense integration project slash AdSense, and it says technically this module is in violation of the AdSense terms of service, but they've never bothered to take it down. <laughs> so maybe just do it whatever the way Google tells you to do it. Uh, I mean, assuming they just tell you to you know take a script, so make a custom block to the scripting in the custom block, embed your your ad block wherever you need it. You know, you could use the block config to control, like if this ad should only show, you know, on this page or only on, you know, this type of content or something like that. That's one way to do it. What kind of website are you integrating this with, Steve? A Drupal site? Um, I'm just uh, in in theory looking. I uh, I I've wanted to, looking to build a review site. So uh, and it. Years ago, I used to put in the manual code in some of my old sites back in the 2000 days. Um, but, uh, you know, then I saw the module in Drupal, but I didn't get around to putting it in because 
I got busy doing uh, the computer support business. And uh, now I have, now that doesn't exist anymore. So I have some time and I'd like to go back to um, investigating that as a possibility. Nice to be able, I mean, it used to actually monetize and make some money uh, with Drupal ads or not Drupal, I'm sorry, um, Google ads. It wasn't a lot, but it was something, you know, why not? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I'd say that adds a bane of the existence of fast websites. Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends. I mean, there are ads that are, that don't bother you, that are not pop-ups, mm -hmm. that just sit on the side. Or they're yeah. just things. you know people want to click on they click on them. if they don't they don't that's the my view I, I don't i don't force people with double you know double no, click. i know i know yeah i'm just saying so, no i get it but uh still you know you, it, it, it's nice to be able to monetize the site yeah for sure you can make a surprising amount of money we, we had some like tech blogs back in like the oos and you know not that many people are reading them and like you get checks <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, I, I even my son did one. He he uh, developed a uh, SSL controller to open his garage door back in like 2010, which had, nothing existed on the market. And uh, he created a blog out there, and he was making you know hundreds of dollars uh, of uh, income from the blog, blog. <laughs> just on such a small item. You wouldn't think it was even such a popular thing, but he he did uh, pretty well. Thanks. And I just want to thank Peter and Chris both for that uh, discussion on the composer. I think that was really timely. I kind of asked in the past, but uh, you by, uh, both came through with some good information. That's uh, uh, I'm going to review it again. Uh, you know, I guess you're uh, Sean, you're going to post this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to go through it again, but uh, it was very helpful. Great. All right, so so our answer to your question is just grab whatever they give you and inject it in there in some way that makes you happy. <laughs> and money, happy and wealthy. <laughs> um, do you have any other uh, questions or things people want to discuss? Um, I have like some really bizarre issue that I was, uh, Maybe gonna ask the group about because I've been scratching my head on it for a couple of days. All right. Sure. So I, I was I, like, are you, gonna, are you gonna tell us? Yeah. No, no, no. I was <laughs> waiting. I was waiting for somebody to tell me. No, no. Uh, so I have a weird thing where I didn't update uh, Drupal update. That's about the only thing I did. I didn't touch the theme. I didn't touch anything else. Uh, I've searched around Google. I've searched around Google. I've searched around Drupal.org for the modules that I got updated. I'm not seeing anybody else complain about this problem uh, just yet. Um, but I'm getting uh, a jQuery error. It might just be the crazy way this site's built. Um, all of a sudden, and I don't have it. You know, in the previous you know commits, and so it just like fails to load, um, and I can't figure out why it's failing to load. I have been able to get it to be fixed by turning off aggregation. So if I turn off There's an issue. Aggreg huh? There's an issue. There's some There's kind of issue. JavaScript the jQuery loading order that was changed mm -hmm. or something. And I saw people, there is an issue somewhere. Okay, cool. So I just need to I don't know where. my Google Foo. Loading. I'm, I'm, the thing you're saying sounds exactly what I've heard. Yeah, I saw something that seemed uh, tangentially related, but I didn't find a good issue for it. Um, but yeah, like it changed in like, you know, the last week, it like works fine on production, but on my test environment, which of course I need to deploy something, it's like totally messed up. Um, so do you think just roll back to a previous version of core? Is that where the bug's coming from? Do you remember? Don't know. Sorry, I'm shrugging, but on my camera, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if... <laughs> I'm also trying to find how it. bad is turning off aggregation for you i guess is the other well question. i don't want the site to be slow <laughs> I, mean, I mean there's sure, a lot but... of javascript files if i don't turn off aggregation if i turn off aggregation it goes from like you know half a dozen javascript files to like two dozen javascript files hmm. 
you know, so it is, it's a big, sure. it's a big diff. Um, all right. So I need to dig around a little bit more or just revert that change and pin it to maybe 9.3. Uh, yeah. I wonder if, I wonder if there's a way to not aggregate one or two of them, like specify or patch to like not aggregate. I don't know if jQuery is aggregated with the others. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess to Chris's point, if it's the loading order, which is what I thought the issue might have been, is that something changed in terms of like what goes where. So like it's getting called later than. Hmm. Um, Although I can't, of course, be. I can't find it now. Oh, of course are you not, using yeah. the are you using the the basic one or using the advanced aggregator module? Ah, uh, advanced. Ah, look at its queue. Yeah, okay, I'm looking there. <laughs> I think that's. I think I moved the issue there. Okay. I turn that off. If I turn that off, like if I bypass that advanced aggregation, it still has a problem with aggregated oh, JavaScript. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I saw something similar. So. I, I thought I saw something similar, but it looked like old. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll poke around some more or revert and hope that things work. Might be my, I don't have to stay up till midnight trying to fix this thing. Is there anything to do with the ones library? Maybe. There's definitely an issue for that. Yeah. All right, I'll poke around, see if I can figure it out. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Yeah, Chris, how's the dog? That That's our new dog. That's is a it? pandemic dog. Yeah, we have two of them now. All right. She, she's an American Strat. Very nice dog. Afraid of everything. Look nice. Look nice. Yeah, we, we just got a new, uh, a red golden retriever. That's someone, uh, is an AKC certified uh, oh. red golden that somebody gave to us. It was two years old. It was a long story, but... Uh, Nice dog. So I think we had a couple new people on the call or relatively new. Um, so we do uh, have have space for Q and A or uh, if you're interested in it sounded like people were interested in finding out if this meetup was right for them. So um, definitely jump in at this point if if uh, you have questions you want answered or just you know, something you want to discuss or find out if this is the right place for you. So we do this tonight. I mean, I did focus on uh, Drupal specifically, though Composer is uh, can basically be used to build lots of different kinds of PHP um, web applications. And yeah, the conceptually, if you understand that it's potentially transferable to things like a Python package manager or a, um, not sure what format it stores those in, but certainly to something like NPM. Um, um, and I guess, you know, conceptually speaking, you know, Java has some similar things and maybe not in, a, in as nice a format. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, you know, obviously Steve's question about uh, Google ads applies to kind of any website, even though he's trying to maybe paste it into a Drupal site. Um, or yeah, as Chris says also, yeah, we've had some good discussions before on uh, web development careers for people um, who are just kind of getting started there. Um, so of course we've got a bunch of grizzled, uh, <laughs> grizzled web developers on here. Um, oh, and Levi was gonna tell us about the thing that he mentioned that I hadn't heard of. Maybe next time, like high level, it's um, JavaScript making requests off to an endpoint and providing results. It's made to like make really fast, fancy looking results. Think like e-commerce and things like that. Hmm. So what's it called? It's called Algolia. Algolia, okay. Not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Algolia, not cheap, that's the name of it. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's the official <laughs> name of it. No, it's a what? It's Elastic Search under the hood, though, right? Isn't that what it is? So what? Is it Elastic Search under the hood or whatever open source version of Elastic Search? Uh, Algolia sure. Site Search. Okay. 
Yeah. So what we end up doing is sending a lot of um, uh, like structured content from Drupal and sending it mm -hmm. over to Algolia and building out like big sets of data that we can then query. Hmm. So you're not using it for like a site search or content recommendation? Not right now, no. We're looking at, at it um, to look specifically for doctors. So like, I need a doctor that does this thing in this location. Hmm. Okay. So it is sort of content recommendation, but in that way? Sort of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but we're not we're not doing like content recommendation in terms of like how you might do e-commerce where you would type in computer and it would be like, do you mean blah, 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 blah. right? Right. Okay, so it is more like faceted search kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's how we're using it. I think there's probably other ways to use it, but just wrapping my head around it. Okay. And. So Sean, do you think that's built on top of Elasticsearch? I think so. Um, I, I looked at it a long time ago. I know Leora had implemented it somewhere. Uh, she liked using it. They have it. a page, Algolia verse, versus Elasticsearch. <laughs> it's built on top of something. It's not like, you know. Yeah. I'm fairly certain it's built on top of something, but I can't remember what tech it's built off. I just, you know, it's just a, I guess they have a whole bunch of other stuff around it. Sure. And, and Levi, would did this project predate you? Like, was, do you know why Algoli was chosen for this? Um, that's a good question. Yes. Uh, uh, well, maybe it predated me, but I definitely was not involved in that. It was more go forth and implement. Hmm. <laughs> and you don't know, you don't know why they chose that versus let's say Elasticsearch or something. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I wasn't stuff. involved in those conversations. Yeah. Okay. And does anyone have have any new or interesting insight into the the Elasticsearch versus whatever Amazon's fork of it is? Um, so Open Search, I guess, is the new name. Is that open I, open source or is that? Uh, I paid? well, I mean, uh, they're both kind of open source. I, so Elastic Search, this looks like kind of a pissing contest between Elastic and Amazon. Mm -hmm. That Amazon was offering hosted Elastic Search, um, and not playing nicely with the Elastic developers or something, and so the Elastic developers essentially. Uh, relicense things in a way that to try to make people deploy, you know, offering it as a service to play nicely. Um, and Amazon was kind of like, well, it's open source, so we're just going to fork it. Um, it's my impression, so I don't exactly know, um, you know. So Amazon is pitching it as a truly open source version and Elasticsearch is probably pitching it as like Amazon's the bad guys who's stealing our work and reselling it without giving us giving back to us. So um
so I don't know, you know, again, it's like um, a little esoteric, um, but I think there was even something funny in the Drupal integration module where it kind of forced you to, um, 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 pick, kind of pick your sides on that. So it sounds like people don't really know. But, you know, I suspect it's gonna be more of an issue in the future when Presumably, Elasticsearch and this new open search diverge. Is that when the moderator goes to get tea? Yeah, all right. So, is this Elasticsearch? Mm -hmm. Is that that's basically like um, they just you said you're, you're Levi. You're sending them like an index, but the do the, the, do they also like I have no, I have not really heard of it before. Does it also like have a crawler or how is it? Um, uh, what's what's the basic premise of how it works? We so I'm, we're using a thing called Algolia. I'm not sure how it connects to Elasticsearch, um, but uh, basically we have to send it all structured data, and it returns. I believe it returns JSON. But effectively, if we don't send it the data, it won't give it back to us. Yeah. So it, it kind of reformats it in a way that it can use. I mean, so it's, or you're, you're basically sending it data and it's getting it to the format the Elastic Search will be able to work with. That whatever their search thing is using, yeah. Yeah. Like we have to, we have to be like really specific about how we format Drupal's data to send it over. Oh, I see. And their thing is all about like analytics and, you know, giving you JavaScript packages that format it on the page, like a little widget and stuff like that. Okay. Cool. But yeah, it's, 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 it is a not insignificant amount of work. Which is great for me. <laughs> yeah. Are there just I mean, a lot of, I'm sorry, are there just a lot of these, uh, this data that you have to massage to get it to work, essentially? Is, is everything, like, do you have to, like, every, like, an image or a video has to be, like, reworked or, or, or some other content? Like, if there's, you break it up between a couple pieces of, of, uh, like, a couple blocks, you have to, like, define it, I mean... It's mostly text that we're sending over, right? So if it's an image, we're just gonna send over the URL of where that image lives. Um, same thing. Yeah. So we're not like actually searching in the image other than the, the, the name of the image itself and the path. Um, at least that's how we're doing it. Maybe there's something that I'm not aware of. Um, what else? Uh, so we're, we're, we're effectively like taking, taking the, the structure of the content type and then assigning the field values out of that into if, if Algolia has opinions about how we should format things like geolocation, then we are restructuring that data so that it lines up to how it wants us to basically like name the array and then, uh, or the object and then send it over. Okay. Yeah, and then sync that every 12 hours or every 24 hours. Um, and then that, like, because it's so highly structured, then we can highly structure it on the back end, like, uh, or on the front end, then, like, you know, facets. And so you click, um, I want to know about all the doctors in this location. And you just click a button and it goes, and it filters it all real fast. And just, you know, instead of 
here are the first 10 results of 1200. Here are the first 10 results of 35. Mm -hmm. Cool. These kind, of, these kind of systems use like data structures and, you know, indexes that are highly optimized for search. Yeah. Like for that, for, you know, not other things. Mm -hmm. right. Cool. And let's see, there was a question from George um, in the chat, though. I don't know if George wants to uh, ask more directly. Currently learning Python. Question about a full stack boot camp versus front end or back end. Um, so I don't know, George, can tell us a little more about your options or what, um, what you're personally interested in might also um, help help tell you which direction to go. Um, yes, um, like I said, I uh, I just started uh, learning a uh, Python, and uh, my uh, cousin he he does UX design, and he got me uh, into the uh, field of working with computers and programming basically, and uh, basically, I uh, I'm more focused on the front end, but I see. Uh, through like Code Academy and a few other uh, websites that they had full stack program. Uh, I have a, a friend of mine who who works 100% uh, with Python and he works on the back end. And uh, he advised me that he said full stack would be good, but he said, you know, it matters mostly of a choice of do you want to work in the front or do you work want to work in the back end? And uh, he said, you know, it's more of a preference of, you know, which one that you might like more. But he said the, the full stack would be a good overall, but he said most of the time you're probably gonna have to pick either front or the back end. And then over time, you'll be able to be a better full stack. Now, is that, a, is that good advice or not? Yeah, I, th I, I mean, I would say probably that's good advice of because you know, lots of people will sell themselves as a full stack developer and have very thin competence on each of those two ends. And therefore probably either don't get the job or get in over their heads. Um, I mean, I, you know, I would say for me personally, probably, yeah, I focus much more on the back end. And, you know, now it's like, well, sure, I have to do some stuff on the front end, but I wouldn't. You know, I so I guess you could call me a full stack developer in the sense that like I'm I'm capable of developing some front end stuff as well as the back end, but it's not not where I've developed my deep expertise. Um, so um, you know, I think you know, question for you is yeah, why did you pick Python? And you know, uh, front end development is like was like really not going to matter as much whether it's Python or something else because you're probably going to be doing a lot of JavaScript and HTML um, and integrating with whatever APIs you have to integrate with. And if you're doing Python backend development, you're going to be working much more probably on yeah server side stuff or you know maybe on getting involved in kind of projects that are not even web based, right? You might be doing much more kind of data data analytics, uh, big data projects with Python. So it depends a little bit which of those things maybe appeals to you more. And, and again, whether you particularly like Python, uh, for example. Yeah, I uh, started off with Python uh, well, because I, I knew a lot of other people that, have, that, have, uh, that do the Python language. And it was a good kind of the first language for me, at least that's what they told me, that it would be a good general uh, language for me to learn Python and uh, Python and JavaScript, those are the two major ones that they were telling me to, uh, to look into. Uh, I know uh, a little bit of JavaScript and I know a little bit of uh, HTML5 and some CSS. So I, I, have a, a, I have the basics of, the, of all three, but I don't really have a, a, deep, a deep, deep knowledge of it. Uh, so that's basically the reason why I kind of started off with, with uh, Python and uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of leaning more towards the front because I have a basic understanding of, uh, of HTML and CSS and, and JavaScript. But, um, you know, I'm just, uh, I guess, taking it, taking it uh, one language at a time and trying to learn uh, uh, Python at a, a, you know, a, a more advanced level. And then I'm going to uh, try to get into the, uh, 
to the HTML, the CSS, and the, the JavaScript uh, at a higher level uh, uh, over time. So one thing I could say, career-wise, there's a I, I'd say for sure there's a lower barrier to entry if you can present yourself as a web developer that can do a little bit of front end, back end, and be productive relatively quickly. Um, then if you were saying, hey, I'm going to be a Python developer that is going to, you know, you know, like write servers and things like that, you know, um, um, if you if you take my meaning there. It's 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 actually easier to get a job if you if you know some JavaScript and some Python, um, etc. Got you, got you. But I don't. I mean, you got to make your own decisions and everything. If you if you really like Python and want to go down that, that, you know, Python. On the other hand, if you if you want to if you get fully exposed to JavaScript and really don't like it, <laughs> um, and want to stay with Python, there, there's actually there's other you know varieties of programming you can do with Python. You know, you can. That don't just involve web, you know. Yeah, I think that's what I was going to say. And you know, the back end, I mean, often in the back end, right, you're going to be integrating then with some kind of data store, or like a SQL database or something else, right? So you're going to, you know, end up spending plenty of time on those, learning those languages and, you know, ways to interact with databases um, on the back end and, um, versus just, um, um, you know, uh, not just Python itself. So, uh, it, seems like, Pyth so it seems like uh, the front end would be a little bit better for me for an employment standpoint. Is that, is that what you guys are saying? It's like HTML, JavaScript, and CSS? I mean, yes and no. Like there's a lot of people that take do that first, right? So, it, um, Probably there's there's an advantage to like probably fewer people know know Python than know some little bit of JavaScript, right? Um, I don't know. Or learn PHP. It's, it's more similar to JavaScript in terms of syntax. I mean, it would actually pay, and you you would be worth your time to actually look on LinkedIn and look on like Google Jobs or people look for jobs these days and like actually see what's there and what they're asking for. You know yeah, what I mean? So you can see where the greatest opportunity is, either in your region or if you're, if you're thinking about relocating or where I work online, remotely, you know. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of uh, front end, front end development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I live in the, uh, I live in uh, the Brooklyn area, so I'm not too mm -hmm. far from mm -hmm. here. There's a lot of work. I just wanted to put in that I think your um, I think the advice you've gotten from your friends sounds pretty solid, and um, you know, and it sounds like, you know, they may have also if you have a network of your friends who are already started at this, you know, that's it's probably good to work off of what they're saying as well. Um, I think it is. I think it's wherever entry points you have, you know, and I think if you've already got in and done some HTML and JavaScript and, you know, I would just, um, you know, I, I think looking for, look, we'll see what the jobs are, but I think continue with what you seem to enjoy as well. I think, um, cause you might find getting in the back end might get a little bit, you know, if you, if you like, if you, if you're interested in design or you're inter interested in how to, you know, like make, make things, you know, move around on a page and, and do some of the interactive stuff, then, you know, you may find that being a front end developer is more fun. But it sounds like you're under good counsel with your friends so far. So keep, keep you know, everything, everything that they've said seems, seems to make sense to me. Uh, guys, can I throw something in there? Sure. Um, I just wanted to know, this is off topic, but I've been seeing a lot of like people talking about machine learning and all these things, right? Like Amazon SageMaker is getting like really popular and then Google has its own platforms. Now, do you, like how long is it, is it like, it seems like it's like right here, you know, everybody's like on this bandwagon and just going at it. 
is it far or is it like closed? Like how, how is it gonna play out? If anyone's familiar with that. For, for, for like, you mean in terms of like everyday use? I mean, you're yeah, talking to web the, developers. For, yeah. You're, yeah. yeah. Yes you're, yes. you're talking to mostly web developers here, so we don't really. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, so, okay. But, there, but it is already at a state where, like, in a typical person could make use of these libraries relatively easily inside a web app if you had a specific use case and, you know, in a trained model, you know, um, you, you, could, you could write a toy application where someone could upload pictures of animals and will tell you whether it's a cat or a dog. You know, you can use these things. Okay. So that's okay. real. And you can use that now. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for the information. And yeah, yeah, I actually enjoyed all of you talking. So it was a it was a good session for sure. Cool. Thanks. All right. If we don't have any more discussion questions, let's, let's go ahead and wrap up for this month. We have that Git talk. Uh, next month, which is kind of a more deep dive into Git, um, which I'm sure a bunch of us use all the time. And, uh, you know, as I said before, you know, if there's uh, some topic you're interested in that you think uh, you'd like your presentation on, you can start reaching out to some people if you want to leave a comment in the meetup. Um, that'd be great. Um, you know, maybe machine learning is one of the ones we could look at, machine learning as it relates to the web and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, unless anybody has something else, uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you. Bye. Good night.